Today, we're going to examine some ideas from a book entitled Americanized Delsart Culture. This book was written by Emily M. Bishop, who was a prominent figure in the American Delsart scene of the late 1800s and early 1900s. She was an educator and lecturer, and her work generally attempted to use Delsartian concepts to help women use their bodies efficiently, avoid nervous agitation, and maintain health and gracefulness. I wouldn't recommend reading this book unless you're particularly interested in the history of how the Delsart system was taught. I intend to bring you the few good ideas in here that are worth using. I can't say I agree with her specific practical exercises, but I do think there's one broader concept that's really quite impactful, and a couple of other ideas that are instructive. The book is written with the expectation that you, the reader, is a woman. Bishop remarks in the book that when she gave a group class or a lecture on the Delsart system, it would be essentially all women, though occasionally a man would attend. And so naturally she expects that if you have an interest in this book, you're likely a woman. Bishop believed that the Americans of her time were practical people, that they took whatever was true and put it to work. So while the Delsart system in France was primarily a system of expression used by actors, singers, and other artists, the purpose of the Americanized Delsart system was health. She saw this transition as natural and utilitarian. Where one person is interested in art for art's sake, 100 are interested in health for health's sake. The classes and lectures that Bishop gave were to help explain how the Delsart system could be used to train the body and mind, the psychophysical self, in order to bring about health. The women that attended these classes and lectures came primarily for that reason, though there was another connected reason. After describing how many women came to deal with specific pains or problems, she writes, Occasionally, a bright-faced girl says, I want to be graceful, and blushes at her own temerity. Or a woman says, I want to get possession of myself. My body is really an encumbrance. I never know what to do with it. Rarely, however, are women brave enough to admit that they wish to discipline their bodies that they may be graceful. Why? Because grace is misunderstood and its value not appreciated. It is commonly thought to be mere prettiness of movement, which is a superficial attraction in society, but of no use whatever to practical people. Health is universally desired, but to desire to be graceful seems to many minds a trifling ambition. Yet grace of movement inevitably helps to maintain health, or to regain it if lost. Grace is as useful as it is beautiful. If we were to teach our children to avoid awkwardness, as solicitously as we try to guard them against the generally accepted causes of illness, we would do more toward making them healthy than our fears and warnings ever will. Americanized Delsart culture makes prominent the utilitarian value of grace. When this value is duly recognized, no man or woman will hesitate to acknowledge that he or she desires to be graceful. Languid movements and lackadaisical airs do not constitute grace. Grace, rightly understood, denotes strength instead of weakness. This is to me the most important part of the book. Grace is often seen in this modern world, just as it was apparently at the turn of the century, to be a sort of extravagance, something the rich do to seem special. But that is a backward way of looking at it. True gracefulness is only possible through coordination and the strength that is generated by that coordination. The rich and powerful want to be graceful in order to appear strong, and they might be satisfied by the mere imitation of gracefulness. We, however, don't want to imitate put-on extravagances of a fake gracefulness. We want true gracefulness, which is essentially efficiency in movement. It is in some sense beautiful to move with grace. We all know that. And it's because beauty is so often tied to health. What is healthy is beautiful. And so our movements should optimally be both healthy and beautiful. I fear that many in the modern world have mistaken awkwardness and clumsiness for authenticity. It very well may be authentic to be awkward in your movement, but only if you are truly discoordinated. That discoordination is a source of poor health. It taxes 
fatigues, and erodes the body. It's not something to embrace. Bishop places a large emphasis on relaxation, and she details a number of relatively simple gymnastic exercises. Breaths are coordinated with various invigorating or relaxing gestures with the limbs and torso. This is essentially what the Delsart system became in America. Though branches of it were still concerned with acting and performance, much of it became about these harmonic exercises, which even at the time were largely seen as a distortion of Delsart's work. In the appendix, Bishop felt it was necessary to address the criticisms that were brought forward by Delsart's daughter, who had come to America and was quite annoyed with how Americans had tinkered with and desecrated the Delsart system. One major objection that Delsart's daughter had was that she said Delsart never used gymnastic exercises. That's interesting because F.M. Alexander was a critic of the exercise culture of his time, and while both obviously did consider movements of the body, neither Delsart nor Alexander used these conventional repetitive exercises in their teaching. It seems to me that the Americans perhaps didn't have the patience for the subtlety of the Delsart system, and instead went headlong into exaggerated exercises. The Americans' harmonic exercises were inspired by the decomposition exercises that Delsart did use. The difference, however, is that in Delsart's decomposition exercises, individual movements were broken out through coordinated movements. To give an example in our modern context, if we attempt to move our head forward and up, most people will move their lower ribs forward at the same time. If we want to break these movements apart, we need to coordinate the movement of the head forward and up with a movement of the lower ribs back. To produce an individual movement, in this case of the head, we need multiple movements, including movements of the torso. The American gymnastic exercises are not at all precise in this way. Instead, you exaggeratedly crumple and relax parts of the body in order to isolate out an individual movement of the head or limb. This emphasis on relaxation is reiterated numerous times in the book, and it reveals a significant problem in the Americanized Delsart system. There is little to no nuance in their description of movements. While Bishop does explicitly want to involve the mind, none of her exercises involve specific coordinations. Relaxation, and really collapse of the body, are seen as freeing one from tension, even though they reinforce the habit of releasing the due tension of the musculature and fascia. For Bishop, the mind is involved in the sense that you are, as she writes, to hold some thought of freedom or rest or tranquility as you engage in one of the relaxing exercises. In other exercises, you are to hold a thought of vigor. But Delsart actually reasoned about movements, and reasoned out the coordinated movements needed to produce grace and health and activity. The American system sacrificed that in order to give it broad appeal and ease of implementation. That was an effective strategy of promulgation. Dalsartism became a sort of craze at the turn of the century in America. Bishop herself educated thousands of physical education teachers as a lecturer at the Chautauqua School of Physical Education. Unfortunately, Rather than teaching a system of reasoning about movements, she taught these repetitive exercises that were, as Delsart's daughter attested, essentially a perversion of his work. While the version of the Delsart system that I teach is aimed primarily at health and not artistic expression, it's significantly different from the Americanized system. We use very specific, reasoned-out standards, protocols, and procedures built around a specific model. Our goal is to invigorate the body, not through repetitive, exaggerated exercises, but through controlled application of our reasoning powers to produce due tension through coordinated movement. However, in reading through Americanized Delsart culture, I can't doubt Bishop's good intentions or her admiration for Delsart. In a very American way, she set out to simplify her understanding of Delsart's work and make it something practical that people, in particular women, could use to improve their lives. While I don't think we can learn much from her specific recommendations, I do think we can heed her call to embrace a desire for gracefulness. Gracefulness in movement is a road to health, and a lack of gracefulness is a road to decrepitude and ill health. I think most people would like to be naturally graceful, but might not have the temerity to actively seek gracefulness. 
In this modern, highly stimulating world, grace will not come naturally to virtually anyone. Awkwardness in movement is the norm. But just desire or willpower will not be enough to produce grace in movement. We need to truly bring our mind and our reasoning powers into the equation and take conscious control over ourselves. That is the path to gracefulness and health.